Dear viewers, welcome back. Hopefully you enjoy the uh, conference so far uh, and, and you really been interested, uh, it, 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 was been, it has been interesting discussion with the government and, and, and the Minister of Education. As always, we'd like to make sure that uh, on every single annual conference we will award three of uh, individuals who contributed the most over the past 12 months uh, to the Business Service Center uh, Forum uh, the development. This year will not be different, even though we are virtual. For those who've been watching uh, awards uh, ceremonies from states a couple of days back, everything has been virtual, so we'll, be, we'll have it virtual as well today. I have the, 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 all the trophies with me, and we'll make sure that we will be handing, handing them over and publish some uh, video footage on, on our social media. Uh, without further ado, let me announce uh, first the winner uh, in alphabetical order. Uh, so first winner uh, of, of the uh, Business Service Center uh, Annual Award is Jana Gajdošíková, who is a representative of the Ministry of Edu e Economy these days. She has been a member of the, of the Business Service Center Forum company, uh, contributing as an as, as, as employee, as a manager, as a supervisor, now sitting on the government side and, and really helping us to introduce uh, uh, policies and, and obviously to shape uh, legislation uh, to make uh, Business Service Center Forum uh, bigger, faster, and, and obviously more, more sustainable. Jana, thank you very much for all your, all your contribution. Our second winner is uh, Tatiana Hargashova. Tatiana has been with us uh, since the uh, beginning. She has been instrumental for training, education, and development. She has been really helping us to, to uh, s settle or, or uh, run programs like Train the Trainer. She has been very, very active in co communication and cooperation with the uh, high school and, and universities. And she's the one who is helping business service center forums find qualified candidates on, on, on the labor market. Tatiana, thank you very much for all your effort. And the last but not least, Matusz Meličko. Matusz is uh, part of the social media group. Uh, uh, as you can imagine, in every, every single industry, Without PR, marketing, and, and publicity, uh, your product, your service will be nothing. And, and even Business Service Center Forum will not be nothing without really the social media effort. Matush has been uh, instrumental for, for est establishing or managing VSCF.eu webpage and obviously has been uh, re instrumental to, to administer Facebook as well as LinkedIn, LinkedIn uh, profile uh, together with uh, Emanuele Terenzani. Matush, thank you very much for really promoting and really making Business Service Center Forum shine. Thanks all winners. As I said, we will be really handing over them uh, in person. We will try to get, to get some video footage and then publish it on the social media. So, uh, let's move on in our, our, our agenda. Without further ado, I would like to uh, announce our next uh, keynote speaker, Tom Bangeman, Senior Vice President, Business Transformation, the Hackett Group, and he'll be talking about the unlocking digital value in business services to raise the transformation first. So, Tom, welcome. Hopefully, you had a very good uh, morning, and so far you enjoy conference. Thanks very much for joining this, this conference, and uh, I would like to really give you floor, so please give us your perspective on uh, Business Service Center Forum and how we can really unlock uh, or be first in, the, in that rally. Floor is yours. Happy to share some of our thinking in terms of where we are and where we're going with our exciting topic of uh, GBS. So, this is an overview of a study that we do on GBS since about 20 years. And don't get worried, I'm not going to do all these studies and all the details of it. But I wanted to show this nevertheless because um, you can see the five key topics that we figured out were the most important in GBS this year, and this is done before COVID. So three of them carry the word digital in them. You can see digital technologies, skills, and benefits out of digital transformation. So it's quite technology and automation heavy in, in essence. And then you see two more topics, innovation and cybersecurity. Um, interestingly, cybersecurity, never was on our sort of critical topics list for five or ten years ago. But recently it's risen to be number one. And I'm sure you all know this is a huge topic because basically everybody's been hacked at some point in time. Companies just don't advertise that. It's not something you would like to say. Um, innovation is interesting. That's been high on the preference list of many companies lately. 
And um, just to clarify something, when you're talking about innovation, we're really just talking about taking an idea that is existing somewhere else and using it in our own area. So it's not invention. Invention would be you invent something completely new, right? So that's not what we're talking about here. It's just innovation. So you can take an existing idea and use it in new space. So it's not too much difficult from uh, too much different from what we used to have in terms of best practice utilization. Sorry. And this is an overview of sort of the development of GBS or shared services, however you want to call them. And we use this picture uh, quite often because it sort of displays the uh, different development over years and there's three maturity stages that typically every single company goes through. And I'm sure you have seen something like this, so it's not rocket science, I know that. But nevertheless, there's something interesting that has happened. For example, this here, you can see on the right side, is the first time that actually there's uh, more companies in stage two than in stage one. And stage one, there's nothing wrong with that. Don't worry if you're in stage one. This is a maturity picture, not a performance picture. But most companies start with setting up a accounting center, one function, one topic, typically servicing one or a few countries. Topic is cost reduction. You standardize, automate, and so on. Many companies are still there. Nothing wrong with that. But then often, when things work out well, you develop into this stage two multifunction mostly called then GBS or business service operation. And the interesting piece there is that we then f change our focus a little bit to be more towards effectiveness. So efficiency never goes away, cost never goes away, but it's a more balanced view in terms of effectiveness and efficiency. And it's nice to see that most companies are getting into this level or even higher. So the model seems to be working quite well. And then there's these magical 9% who are up there in stage three. Now, it's not that the number doesn't grow. The number actually does grow. It's just that there is more companies entering the picture. So the 9% still in numbers of centers is, is higher. And in stage three, it's more about business value. So that is a very exciting discussion that we're unfortunately not going to manage all today because that would take a whole different presentation. One of the main issues that we identify when you get into stage two and stage three, though, is this. We used to structure companies in a functional way just for complexity reduction. So, for example, our reporting still typically is in, in functional orientation. Now, since at least 10 years, we've been telling everybody that you need to look at processes. You need to do this so-called end-to-end orientation and look at things from origin to recipient. But the way that the customer, both the internal and external, and all of us in our private lives want to have things is the customer orientation on the right side. So now for a GBS organization, this is a bit tricky, right? So our, our reporting still is in functional orientation. We often structure our work in process orientation, but actually our service catalog, if we really do it well, should be on customer orientation. So it would possibly even have names for services that are, are different than actually the process description. And this is quite difficult for most companies. So in essence, it, it sort of produces this problem that I thought this um, shop sign here was ex exhibiting nicely. So we offer three kinds of service, good, cheap, and fast. You can pick any two. Good service cheap won't be fast. Good service fast won't be cheap. And fast service cheap won't be good. So obviously, um, this is not what we really want, but this is what in reality it often is because if we're trying to, for example, save cost, we often struggle with improving the service quality and at the same time reducing cost. But that is actually the, the challenge we have. Now, if we then move a little bit towards this topic of digital transformation and automation that was highlighted in the title, we asked all these GBS organizations, whether in the past, digital transformation has actually made any contribution, any positive contribution to them, whether it was you know, low or high. And you can see here efficiency, effectiveness, experience are the first three. And I'm not going to go through all the details, but you can see there's more dark color than light color on the picture, which means that there's good results. Most companies report that they have moderate or high 
digital transformation contribution. So that's great to see. So it seems to be working and the numbers in the GBS environment are often better than they are in other functions in general. And I'm not gonna do a, a, a lot of discussion about COVID because our feeling from our client discussions is that people are a little bit tired of discussing COVID. But nevertheless, let me tell you what we think might be the um, impacts of COVID on the model that I already um, highlighted and, and was obviously there before the pandemic. So there's a lot of things on this slide that you know, for example, moved work to home and so on. We don't need to cover that because everybody knows that it worked quite well. There are some things though that are quite different from country to country. And I would tell you that if you really go through these topics in detail with different people from different countries, you'll figure out that there's actually nothing that people agree on. I mean, absolutely nothing. Not even that the, that the pandemic is bad because for some people, business is fantastic. So that's one of the interesting things that on all of these numbers, people will have very different views. So average numbers on a COVID study actually don't mean much because you will have 20% of companies who are fighting for survival. You will have maybe 10% at the other end who are doing fantastically. And then you have a lot of people in the middle who have still very specific issues. So for example, in the middle, we have instituted hiring freeze, 62%. Now you might say that's pretty normal, but actually, for example, in your neighboring Czechia, only 8% instituted a hiring freeze, and in India, 100% instituted a hiring freeze. So there's very, very different results. And what is most interesting considering the topic of this presentation is the line below that, accelerated use of automation. Not surprising. I mean, we were automating as much as we could everybody before, and you can see that automation was accelerated through COVID. We all know that, but now comes the interesting piece. In the middle, you can see 78% of companies are saying, this is the thing that they continue or increase the most out of all these things. So we need to automate even more. And then right off that, it says only 12% think that this has worked well. So that's a pretty dramatic result in terms of how well this automation worked. So yes, we all know these nice examples from putting in Teams and Zoom tools for the company on a weekend. That all worked. But many of the other things don't actually work that well. And that's why uh, I think I'll dive into this technology topic a little bit more to explain. So this is, this is a digital transformation landscape. And don't worry, I'm not going to cover models in detail because they tend to be quite boring. But there is a message on this um, picture nevertheless. What we see happens when people look at something like this and start thinking about how they want to actually go about this digital transformation is that it takes you about 10 seconds and then you're on the bottom of the slide and you're looking at this smart automation area and you start discussing whether you do RPA or cognitive or, or some other AI solution. Nothing wrong with that in principle, but the better idea would be to start from top to bottom and first consider who you are, what kind of environment you're working in. And then in the second line of this slide with the business expectations, why are you actually doing this automation? Is it because of cost or because you want to increase customer uh, happiness or is it maybe quality or is it agility? You know, I mean, last three years, all the conferences were about agility that didn't go away. It's just that we have a pandemic now and don't talk about it. We still need agility. So what, what is the main reason for doing this? And depending on that reason, the business case and the tool selection and the process design might be very different. And, and we often see in our clientele that that's one of the reasons why the results aren't so good in terms of the automation results. And we also looked at the different technologies because clients often would like to have some magic tool and, and ask us, well, you know, which one of these different technologies is the one that we really need? Do we really need all of it? And here you need different, here you see different technology families, for example, RPA, 70%, analytic, 76%. So that's the usage by the, by clientele. So you can see that most numbers are high, which means that everybody's using a mix of all of these tools, maybe with the exception of voice 
which is quite low, although very interesting. And I would estimate that in the GBS environment, that will be one of the things that will grow in the near future. So what is the point of the slide? The point of the slide is to say, there isn't one type of technology. It's not RPA, nor is it analytics, nor anything else that alone will solve all, all the issues. But it is rather like here in this picture. It's a puzzle of different pieces that we need to put together and it should fit your environment so it works for you. And here are just some of the logos in this space. And I'm not going to cover the logos. The logos are just here to exhibit that there's a lot of these logos. and you could produce a new slide like this basically on a monthly basis. It's unbelievable how many of these tools are being uh, generated and, and enter the market. But the point of the slide is to say, now imagine you are the person who wants or needs to build this ecosystem. How are you going to go about this? I mean, do you know anybody who knows all of these tools and how they work? So this is where the other side of technology comes in play, which is talent. So the biggest problem we have actually in building these ecosystems to go further with the digital transformation is that we don't have all the right skills in the right amount. Maybe there are these skills, but not for everybody to have a perfect team of people who can do all these things. And this is just a visualization of, you know, when you practically would start with this, it would actually be quite tricky. And then there's a slide that exhibits automation levels in GBS that um, we have been using for years, but I still wanted to remind you of this because I, you know, this is sort of a slide that I used in a sarcastic way on purpose, just to make the point. So the question here was, we're trying to figure out what the process automation level is in GBS and whether it is managed, targeted, measured or none. And without going into too much detail, you can see 51% here said that they are not measuring at all. 13% said they define some KPIs, but they don't have targets. So I wonder what I'm going to do with the number if I don't know where I'm going. Then some have KPIs defined and target sets, but they don't know how to get there. And then there's 21% who have KPIs defined target sets and major initiatives defined. So in GBS, which has been around for 25 years now and is very metrical. We would assume everybody has metrics and KPIs and some idea of how you get there, but the reality tells us that that might not be the case. So, you know, I'm being sarcastic on purpose, but what's the point of having all these metrics if we don't put targets and initi initiatives behind them? So the, the result didn't look very good on this one. Here's some slides that I just show briefly, just to exhibit that if we look at technology adoption and effectiveness of that for different types of uh, topics. On left, you see legacy applications, robotic process automation, and so on. N never mind. You can read this in detail if you're interested. But the point I want to make is on the right side, where we see the results of this business objectives realization. You can see that there's a lot of red on the slide. So actually, a lot of people said it fell short of expectations. And I'm sorry. And the second slide with data related technologies and emerging technologies, so newer things is even worse. There's even more red on these slides. So even before COVID, the results from technology projects were not very great. Now, there could be two reasons for this. One would be, or three reasons for this. One would be expectations are wrong or expectations are too high, let's put it that way. That could be. The other op uh, option would be that the implementation was not done well. That could also be. And the third one could be that the tools are just not there to, to do it. In most cases, it's not so much the technology that wouldn't be there. It's, it's rather a mix of, of the first ones. And this is a typical timeline issue that we are getting. So when we, for example, estimate how these technology uh, utilization levels are going to grow in the near future. Here's just an example, we're using RPA, but you could use something else. The company is gonna, gonna estimate what the limited adoption and broad adoption levels are. And then when we look at this thing backwards, we're often gonna see that the, the speed of implementing things is significantly lower than you would actually have estimated beforehand. So. What happens is this quote at the bottom from a client who said, at this pace, my three year transformation plan is going to take 10 years. So 
I'm not saying this is in your company. Of course, you might be doing it great, right? But the other guys, they are often building these plans and then just going ahead with something, but not really taking the timeline and the target seriously, but rather just moving the right direction. And then every year you produce a nice marketing presentation showing how far you've gotten. But that's not really going to help in the long run. So as a nice quote for this digital area, I'm borrowing this one, but when digital transformation is done right, it is like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. But when done wrong, all you have is a really fast caterpillar. And you know, a fast caterpillar is not going to help us. So again, when you look at this from a process point of view, what often is the issue that none of these nice logos or tools here will solve it alone. But rather, when you look at the process on the bottom, it looks more like this, you know? You need to have different slices and different tools and use all of them in a nice combination. And if you look at these different technology families, then actually the one in the middle, RPA, is the one that actually typically does not contain AI, artificial intelligence, the rest does, just from an orientation point of view. Here's a nice example, uh, and I'm not gonna do the details, but this client actually um, automated all of the reporting, and I don't mean reporting in terms of producing numbers, but reporting in terms of producing the text that explains it. And you can see the tools on the slides. I'm not going to dive into the detail because I get into time issues otherwise. But I wanted to summarize these um, technology initiatives and, and the message uh, on that topic on this slide. Often when clients look at different initiatives they could run, they categorize it more or less this way. Box three here are these sort of multi-year transformation initiatives that while they produce great results, they take longer and then you might not always want to do that because there's a risk and it has a lot of cost and, and time and effort in it. So people are looking for box two. Box two are all the quick wins and strong initiatives that provide NPV or payback quickly. And nothing wrong with that except for one thing. These things are typically focused on efficiency. And what we really want, at least on top of box two, is box one, which we would call star initiatives, which are initiatives that influence business outcomes. You know, revenue, spend, risk, could be other things. And, and these are often, often not considered enough. So that would be my message. Don't forget those and just focus on cost reduction. What now will be the biggest risks? The biggest risk in uh, doing all these projects, if you look at this slide, and it's GBS specific, actually is on the bottom of the slide, it's access to critical new talent. So I'm sort of closing the loop on that talent topic. While we, are, while we can debate all these technologies and how good or bad they are, the issue at the end will be more on the talent side. And that might also be a message to different locations or different people who work on location attractiveness because that clearly is number one. Interesting is also that top performers don't rank it that high as an issue. So they often, they often um, get the people because they might have a better performance or a better branding and therefore they can attract their best talent. But, you know, 80% of the others they will have a huge issue with it. Now, to close, I want to give you a prediction on where GBS will go. And my first prediction is, I predict your predictions will be wrong, as will mine. But still, we all want to hear these things, right? We all know that we don't know what's going to happen, but let's try nevertheless. And here's an overview of sort of main predictions for different functions. And of course, the one we're mostly interested in is GBS on the bottom left. But let's say for the most important pieces, for example, finance, which always is a big part of your GBS landscape, we, we need to change from this nonlinear thinking. You know, the, the analytics piece that comes in from the EPM side is going to help us build scenarios, analyze things, and not go in, in calendar cycles, and not just extrapolate numbers on an Excel sheet. But we really have to start thinking about the content and running scenarios. And that might be much more exciting for people who do that work than just extrapolating on an Excel sheet. And just to close for the GBS um, area on the top, uh, on the bottom left, sorry. As many people have stated, COVID-19 reveals resilience 
of the shared service model and not just in Slovakia but everywhere and our prediction is that it lead, in general it this leads to increased GBS usage now to be fair I think we're all slightly biased because we we work with or in GBS and therefore we would like it to increase so we need to be careful that when you when you're in it you're biased but but nevertheless I think there's a lot of data that shows that most likely it will increase what the service model will look like I'm sure there will be plenty of discussion on that and pro potentially in the next presentation too um, I think for example uh, to give you one example I think scope will increase radically in other functions and the other um, other interesting piece will be the discussion about what is a location and where the employees need to sit and and whether the national boundaries or their locations are actually physical or whether location actually refers to something more organizational in the future so that said thank you very much for your uh, attention i hope it was helpful Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, thanks for uh, this interesting presentation. And now is the time for Q&A, so I would like to remind our viewers that there is an option to use uh, Slido. It's on, on the right side of, of your screen. Please uh, pose any questions which you might have for Tom. Uh, Tom, let me kick it off uh, with the first question. In a survey which uh, Business Service Center Forum in Slovakia ran uh, for to, to uh, monitor or, or somehow explore landscape over the last 12 months, 44% uh, of the companies said that they will or they plan to automate at least 10% of their processes within the next two, three years. But 41% uh, of them said that they don't have any target. In your presentation, you touched that a little bit. So what is, what is your recommendation? Is it, is it good to have a target? Because at the, ed at the end, you've, you've been really setting a little bit of uh, thoughts uh, in, into our head. So uh, if you have biases, if you have plans, and, and if, if, if you uh, don't really fulfill them, so is it, is it better to have a plan uh, or say we will automate and we'll automate as much as we can? So what, what's your view on that? I think you know the answer from my presentation. <laughs> I mean, it's always good to have a plan and in digital transformation I believe if you don't have a digital transformation journey plan or map you're not going to get there. Without a plan you don't have a target and if you don't have a target you, you would never know that you actually reach it, right? Um, it's not the end of the world if you don't reach every target but um, that was one of the main issues I was trying to exhibit that um, that we're not getting anywhere if we're just sort of bot building up bottom-up things and, and communicating then some marketing messages. It, in the long run, the only solution is, is to really set more or less aggressive targets and try our best to get as close as possible. But on the other hand, in your presentation, you scared me a little bit, to be honest with you, because you said that every month you need to rebuild one of your, one of your slides because there are no new tools, new, new gadgets are really be, become available, new startups are really coming with the, with the breakthrough area. So uh, being a CEO or, or CTO or chief financial officer of big corporation, and I would say, okay, I understand that I need to, I need to probably uh, innovate or, or transform my organization, maybe introduce a little bit of automation, uh, but uh, what is the best course of action then, like if, if the landscape is changing that dramatically? You need to constantly stay involved. That's the, that's the course of action. It's, you know, the, the old way IT was done, we all know this, was that you had very long-running projects with milestones and, and it was fairly simple from that point of view because we knew how the tools work and we could implement them over a long period of time. And, and nowadays we be, need to be more agile. That's why, that's why this word has come up because there really is a need to, to keep changing things once in a while. Uh, I think the big opportunity for GBS, if we want to look at it positively, is to, to set up something like a COE, if you don't have it already, center of expertise, and it typically starts with RPA or some, some um, smaller tool, because IT is not going to, as a function, IT is not going to cover all these things, except for if IT is embedded in GBS. And it's not against IT, it's just that it's a more, it's a more holistic approach to use the skills in the wider organization and also in the outside ecosystem to produce the transparency and knowledge to be successful. So, so that's sort of my idea how this should, should work. Don't rely on the three experts that have always been there, nothing wrong with them, right? But the, it's, it's unrealistic to ask them to know everything. 
Well, thank you very much. Uh, one of the AMCHEM uh, in, uh, pillar is innovation. And, and uh, as of yesterday, for example, we've, we've been sitting on a meeting with uh, one uh, large uh, corporation in, in Slovakia and really talking to uh, their chief uh, the marketing officer, chief strategy officer, uh, head of customer care, uh, sales person, as, as well as the finance person. I was really surprised and uh, amazed, to be honest with you, that, that automation transformation is no longer only IT department responsibility, but everybody in a company is really talking about it. Is this your experience as well, or, or how you see it in, in other companies? Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you take the example of IPA, because it's just been sort of the recent uh, one that everybody's been uh, debating, 90% of the COEs are not in IT. They're either in business or they're in GBS, and mostly in GBS. And, um, and if you link that with this maturity curve that I showed you in the beginning, often shared service centers struggle to get up that maturity curve because the stakeholders don't always trust them or give them credibility for what they do and trust them to go further. And having a COE like that and producing these more innovative, more you know, technology-based services, maybe for a broader organization, is, is a great lever. I mean, that might be the, the trick, in a sense, to get out of stage one and move to stage two and three. So, so I would really encourage people to use or to see the situation as an opportunity in terms of taking an active driving seat in the technology development and automation of the organization and and even further than just GBS itself. So tra transformation automation is no longer a question like IT guy comes to uh, walk into the office of the, of the uh, chief financial officer and said I need a million dollars to innovate and automate and he says go away because our our share, our EBITDA or or I don't know cash flow does not allow that right so it's a it's a joint 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 uh, joint event. Uh, we have a question from Slido. Tom what do you think is the top driver for lack of transformation in GBS, but perhaps not only in GBS sector? Well, we, we would have a million slides to explain you that from different, <laughs> different <laughs> angles. But the, lack, the, the main lack of transformation is that, you know, if you w really want to do it in simple words, people are, are lazy and typically quite happy with what they've got, and they only move when they have to move. And that's no different in GBS or in any other function. So whenever there's a a need, a burning platform, a crisis, or however you want to call it, then, then we start moving. So what we need is, we, we need the drive. Initially, we need the drive. And it must come through individuals. So if you have individuals who produce that drive, it often helps a lot. And, and, and a few individuals can, can produce a lot of movement, surprisingly. But it still is like that. So I would encourage everybody who's got that energy and stamina to just, you know, pitch in. Well, time is, time is really running, running crazy, but uh, maybe last question. You tried to avoid it during your presentation, but I will still really push you to that direction. Uh, did COVID really accelerate it, inhibit it, uh, transformation, or what was the influence of COVID on uh, thinking of, of the transformation, not transformation itself? Yeah, I wasn't trying to avoid it. I just didn't want to discuss only COVID because <laughs> I feel that that's, uh, people are getting really tired of it. But... Um, we had some trends before, as I tried to exhibit, and the trends are still the same in essence, but there are adaptations to the model, so some things are moving quicker, like automation and scope uh, increase are probably moving quicker now, because we have seen that basically everything can be done remotely, so those arguments that you couldn't put it into GBS are basically dead. Now, you don't have to, but you know, it works. And then the location topic is one to sort of still keep discussing. What does it mean, a location? Uh, it, like in your discussion, if you're in Slovakia, why not use labor from surrounding countries? But equally, a company could think about, well, do I need to have these locations in terms of the centers, or can I not use 20 or 30 locations globally because it's more virtual? So, you know, it co could go both ways. I think, personally, in some is that locations who, are, who provide good cost-efficient labor actually win after this pandemic goes away. They, they're going to benefit from this. And, and Western European countries, you know, where I live, are rather going to um, lose as a, as a result of this. So um, for, for delivery locations, I think it's, it, I mean, pandemic is not good news, but the results of it have more positive effects, I think. 
All set, Tom Bangeman, Senior Vice President, Business Transformation of the Hackett Group. Thank you very much, Tom, for being with us. Uh, as a, as a, uh, information for viewers, probably you got that information. Tom will be available after the conference uh, starting at 1 for half an hour in a virtual uh, chat room. So you can, you can join that. It will be in your, in your user, user profile.